We all know that Einstein was a genius, so much so that his brain worked more effectively than that of a thousand scientists. He delved into realms of knowledge that were previously unimaginable, tackling concepts we had never even considered, let alone understood. Einstein dedicated his efforts to making these complex ideas accessible to the entire world. Albert Einstein, a renowned physicist, is credited with publishing the theory of special relativity, introducing the equation E is equals to mc square, and formulating the laws of photoelectricity, leaving the world astonished. And thus, he was honored with the Nobel Prize. Observing his extraordinary intellect and profound understanding, people are inclined to believe that Einstein possessed a remarkable brain, distinct from that of an ordinary human. Einstein himself acknowledged this uniqueness, and as a result, expressed a preference against posthumous research on his body. Instead, he had instructed for his body to be cremated. However, what Einstein had feared came to pass. On April 13th, 1955, when Einstein passed away at Princeton Hospital, the doctor who conducted the autopsy secretly took Einstein's brain. Driven by curiosity to unravel the mysteries within the mind of this genius, the doctor decided to examine the brain against Einstein's wishes. The doctor who took possession of Einstein's brain was Dr. Thomas Harvey, driven more by the desire to study the remarkable organ than by the fear of consequences. Once Princeton Hospital learned of this incident, they terminated Dr. Harvey's employment. However, Dr. Harvey successfully persuaded Hans Albert to grant him permission to conduct research on his father's brain and share the findings with the world. Thus began a long journey for Einstein's brain. Dr. Harvey, a pathologist with expertise limited to post-mortem examinations, believed in his ability to explore the intricacies of the genius's brain. The sequence of events unfolded as follows. Dr. Harvey found himself without a job and the title of a pathologist at Princeton Hospital. Taking Einstein's brain with him, he relocated to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he extensively photographed the brain and dissected it into 240 small pieces. Each piece was preserved in separate jars, which he then concealed in his basement. This decision led to arguments with his wife, who threatened to dispose of the brain. Eventually, these disputes culminated in a divorce. Dr. Harvey then moved to Wichita, Kansas, taking Einstein's brain with him and started working as a medical supervisor. During his free time, he attempted to study Einstein's brain. Over the years, Dr. Harvey changed jobs frequently and moved to different cities, yet he struggled to conduct substantial research on the brain. His medical license was eventually revoked, forcing him to take a job at a plastics factory. Realizing the limitations of his own capabilities, Dr. Harvey made a crucial decision to send various pieces of the brain to the world's leading neurologists for detailed research. In 1985, 30 years after the brain was initially taken, a study on Einstein's brain was published. Over the next 28 years, numerous neurologists conducted and published several studies on the brain of this renowned genius. In the study, it was discovered that Einstein's brain exhibited notable differences from the ordinary human brain, with the most significant distinction found in the corpus callosum. It's crucial to understand that the human brain is divided into two hemispheres. The processing of tasks occurs in one hemisphere, and signals are then sent to the corresponding part of the body. Specifically, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body, while the right hemisphere controls the left side. For 90% of humans, the left hemisphere is responsible for functions such as speech, comprehension, mathematical calculations, and writing. In contrast, the right hemisphere governs creativity, understanding shapes, art, and music. Now, what is the role of the corpus callosum? Consider the scenario where you are typing on a keyboard or mobile phone, and both your hands are actively engaged in typing. The left hand is inputting certain alphabets, and simultaneously, the right hand is doing the same. During this typing process, an error occurs in your left hand, and you promptly utilized your right hand to correct that mistake. This implies that when your right brain made an error, it rectified it by signaling the left brain. The conduit facilitating communication between both hemispheres of the brain is known as the corpus callosum. In Einstein's case, his corpus callosum was larger than that of ordinary humans, indicating a robust connection between his left and right brain hemispheres. This strong connection allowed Einstein to envision intricate problems and scenarios. 
In addition to the disparity in the corpus callosum, the pattern of Einstein's brain was also distinctive from others. Researchers suggest that this uniqueness contributed to a robust flow of neurons. A proficient flow of neurons indicates a formidable capability for mathematical calculations. Albert Einstein possessed the ability to solve complex mathematical problems mentally, without the need for pen and paper. According to a research paper, another reason for the high number of neurons in Einstein's brain was its weight, which measured 1,230 grams. In comparison, the average weight for normal human brains is 1,400 grams. Researchers propose that Einstein's brain had a thin lining, leading to a higher density of neurons. However, a significant question arose. Did Einstein possess such a special brain from birth, or were there subsequent changes? Upon investigation, it was discovered that when Einstein was born, he began speaking after the age of five, unlike other children who typically start speaking at two or three years old. Even after he started speaking, he did not express a strong inclination to talk and often remained absorbed in his own thoughts. Additionally, he demonstrated a lower capacity for memorization. Notably, he found it challenging to memorize simple multiplication tables. Einstein's strength lay in his ability to process mathematics and numbers in a logical manner, rather than relying on memorization. In his school life, although he struggled in other subjects, Albert Einstein excelled in mathematics and science. When he was 12 years old, a family teacher left his geometry book at Einstein's house. Surprisingly, Einstein read the entire book in one day, clarifying his geometric concepts. Not only that, but he also became a master of integral and differential calculus by the age of 14. His command over mathematics and science was so formidable that professors would feel nervous when he raised his hand to ask questions. As Einstein's inquiries were often challenging even for the teachers to comprehend, from a very young age, Einstein aspired to encapsulate the laws of the universe in a concise equation, making this his life's mission. At the age of 26, Einstein published four research papers that astounded the world. Consequently, he was awarded a PhD degree and the Nobel Prize for his outstanding contributions to humanity. Without Einstein's theses, the realm of science would be incomplete. Many doctors and scientists concluded that Einstein's brain acquired its distinctive characteristics after his birth. The primary factor contributing to this was his approach of seeking answers through his own intellectual efforts when faced with unanswered questions. This practice, starting from a young age, played a significant role in the special development of his brain. Today, Einstein's brain is preserved at America's The Mutter Museum carefully maintained in microscopic slides. I hope you enjoyed this Absolute Facts video. Please like and share it. We sincerely appreciate your kind comments. Stay tuned for another fascinating video. Until then, take care.